question one. Hello. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So, a uh, few things before we start. Um, so, I sent you yesterday, I created this Google survey. Uh, you don't have to do it. I would appreciate it if you did. It's just my way to know how the class is, is going. And, uh, you know, we, we're very much used to teaching evaluations uh, here. And so, I, uh, yeah, it's, it's part of my teaching uh tasks usually so I would appreciate some feedback uh, <clears throat> just a few questions uh, to be ranked between one and five five is the best one is the worst I've seen that three of you have done it it's anonymous so I don't know who has done it but uh, uh, thanks for going through that um, and then <clears throat> uh, I see excitement about gravity gradient I just received an email from one of you including it. I'm, I'm very happy to see that. Uh, as you may have realized, we're doing much more than momentum exchange devices. This is the first time that I uh, teach a class uh, on these topics in, in such a short time frame. So I wasn't sure about how much material could be covered, but I'm glad that we can actually do more. Uh, I'm not going to give you a grade on uh, the additional material, but I think it's good for you to and for me to cover it. And so uh, homework one and two are the same, um, so I don't really expect any issues with the grades, really. But uh, I'm glad to see that uh, that we are able to uh, uh, to do more uh, more than momentum exchange devices. <clears throat> uh, tomorrow, since we talked about gravity gradient and a little bit about aerodynamic drag, even though you're not performing any exercise on that, and the Apunov control. Uh, I asked one of my postdocs, who was a PhD student and finished in December, uh, to present some of his work on using the drag the orbit device, that system with the four deployable surfaces that I presented the first uh, time we met. Um, he's using it for attitude control, uh, using gravity gradient and uh, aerodynamic torques simultaneously. So he's using uh, a technique called adaptive control and integral concurrent learning to uh, um, at the same time maneuver and uh, estimate some unknowns uh, in the in the environment. So I asked him if you could present as part of the lecture uh, for an hour or so his work tomorrow, uh, the first time, you know, the first uh, slot that we meet. Uh, so will, there will be more advanced material, uh, which is actually presented in one of my papers and I will post uh, one of our papers, the 3 ds work, and I will give you that paper. Um, so, you see that I'm sharing my screen. Uh, we will continue today on the homework two. Uh, the lady who was working on it yesterday, we can definitely continue with her if she's up to the uh, challenge, I guess. Um, but uh, maybe we'll continue a little bit more on theory and dedicate uh, uh, time to that later in the day, just because I'm pressure now. Uh, okay, I think those are the announcements. Uh, before I start, do you have any questions, comments, concerns? No. Okay. So you see that the notes that I'm sharing, the ones that I that have been with you since day one uh, in the Monday 22nd folder. So they end when we talked about the control law for the momentum exchange devices and how to solve for eta with the minimum uh, control effort solution. So I'm not going to derive anything by hand because we've done all this already. But uh, here I was extending the same exact approach to uh, a system where now the spacecraft is rigid again and there are thrusters. So much simpler equations, because you don't have momentum exchange devices, uh, you only have the ability to create an external torque. So uh, there's no exchange of momentum internally due to rotating components. It's only uh, thrusters that are firing. So the first page is introducing like, exactly like we've done before, a Lyapunov function of the error in the angular velocity and in the quaternion with respect to some desired uh, trajectory. We want the time derivative to look at uh, like uh, this quadratic form uh, we derive the same time derivative uh, from the definition of V. We equate the two, 
uh, and uh, basically show that the third time derivative of V is also negative, so that this is a good Lyapunov function that even for omega going to zero, omega error going to zero will stabilize uh, both omega, well, it will stabilize the, the quaternion. So exactly the same things that we done last time. And so uh, the, the, the difference and simplification, which is a big one, is that the equation of motion is just this, uh, this, this uh, line here, is uh, j omega of the body dot plus omega of the body cross j omega of the body. That's it. And, and, and it's equal to any disturbance torques plus some thruster torque. So th uh, indicates thruster. And so if you compute the dynamics uh, with the Lyapunov function that we have derived, that we have defined actually, uh, you, you follow the same exact steps, it's just that everything ends in a few lines uh, of calculations because we don't have those, uh, 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 those big terms due to the MEDs. And uh, you can see that the, uh, the thrusters will basically have to uh, match these terms if you want to track a certain trajectory. They will have to cancel out disturbance torques and then be equal to minus k the error in omega minus the first three components of the quaternion error and these uh, you know leftover terms j omega desired dot plus omega of the spacecraft cross j uh, omega uh, very simply and uh, um, you know the uh, here there's a note that the elements that had a plus now have a minus with respect to what we had for momentum exchange devices. Why? Because this is an external torque. Um, see, when we talked about momentum exchange devices, and at some point I derived that TMED, we call it a torque, but if you think about it, there's nothing external. Well, the disturbances will be external, but everything else um, in that expression, uh, it's not really a classical torque. It's just things moving inside, and, if, and so that's why the, the terms that now have a minus had a plus before, uh, because again, this is now really an external torque. It's compensating uh, for things like, uh, you know, this term omega cross j omega, et cetera, while it was different before. It was not an actual external torque. And a few more comments to wrap this up. Um, if you have thrusters, and these thrusters are usually, of course, body mounted, um, if you ever get, uh, uh, the opportunity to travel to Florida. There's uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. There's one of the four space shuttles that are now in museums, and you can see things very closely. And uh, uh, the space shuttle has a lot of openings on the body that are uh, reaction systems. Those are basically small thrusters for fine adjustments of the orientation, in particular. And uh, and so they're they're uh, mounted in certain locations, and each one of them will give a different contribution to the torque. And once you have a desired uh, T thruster, this is a three-component vector in the body axis of the spacecraft. Then you uh, you have to decide how you you create that torque. And uh, while for momentum exchange devices it was. Uh, especially for the action wheels, it's quite simple. You have a certain torque on the x-axis that you want to exert. If, you, if the wheel is mounted exactly on that axis, you spin it up, spin it down. In this case, you have to map the thruster. So you basically have to decide which ones you're going to turn on for how long. Um, and uh, it depends on how many you have and where they are. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a nonlinear problem that you need to solve. And, and also the other issue, uh, issue number two, is that uh, thrusters are on-off. Uh, no matter what you, you read uh, these days with electric thrusters and, and modulation capabilities, the reality is that technology is such that you know, thrusters are basically on off. Uh, they can be on continuously or, or not. Uh, you know, the, the duration of, of the puff, if you want to call it that way, uh, may be almost instantaneous or extended, but they're still you know, things that cannot usually finally modulate a force. And so, the issue number one is it will look like this. Uh, you will have the side torque, which is, which is usually a three component vector in the body axis. And then you have a matrix that maps all the different forces that I'm calling U. Uh, and this can be many, uh, not only you know six, for example, they can be 12, or as many as you want. You can have multiple thrusters mounted on your satellite, like I just mentioned for the space shuttle. Uh, and then you have a matrix that maps all these thrusters into a torque. 
So you have to invert in principle H, which is not a unique solution. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you can find the different approaches in ACT Astronauticas and Journal Guidance of Approved Papers. Uh, you can go with a pseudo inverse. Uh, well, I have an example that we can go back to. Uh, I have to find it actually. These are old notes. Uh, but I think this goes beyond what we want to do. But in other words, there's not just one way to solve for this equation and find the u. Because u in general are, uh, there better be more than three, of course. Uh, well, yeah, especially if you want to do plus minus uh, torque. And so there is not just one solution. And for issue number two, uh, pulse width uh, modulation, for example, or pulse width pulse frequency modulation uh, can be uh, a way. So not only I have to decide how I turn them on off, I also have to decide how long I turn them on and off and uh, for how long and when. So uh, just to give us, you know, so you've seen this before probably, but to give you an idea of what I mean, um, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Um, you know, the, the control law uh, may give you, say, on the x-axis of your spacecraft, uh, this is time, it may give you a torque that, you know, varies like this, but your thrusters can only give you a torque that is either plus a certain value minus a certain value, right? And so you have to decide what you're going to do to try to track this behavior. Um, and so there are different things you can do here. Of course, the torque is exceeding your max. So maybe you're just going to fire at the maximum value. But then what do you do? Do you switch it off? Um, you never turn it on. So there's, you know, different, different ways you can set the threshold after which you always go on or off. Um, Uh, but there's more elaborate ways to try to match the area under curve with the one that you can obtain with the thrusters. And, and so that's that's really beyond uh, uh, what we want to discuss, but really there's there's these two big problems when you have thrusters. Uh, and uh, and the, the ultimate result of this is that given the on-off nature of thrusters uh, uh, and their different locations on the face cap, for attitude control, they're usually less accurate than momentum exchange devices because they cannot continuously give you a required torque with, uh, you know, with fine precision. Uh, at some point, you will hit uh, a limiting cycle, and uh, there's so much you can do uh, with the thrusters. Okay, uh, so I didn't want to cover much more than that, other than uh, showing you how those uh, equations that we saw simplify uh, for thrusters, but then you introduce completely different set of problems. So the equations are nicer, but then the way you actually realize that torque in practice, uh, it's more complicated. Uh, it requires a lot of massaging of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, how the logic to turn on and off the thrusters. Okay, so as I said, since you seem to be digesting the topics pretty well, and uh, uh, you're more than capable of uh, staying on, 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 on track with the assignments. Uh, I decided that I, I was going to extend and uh, look a little bit of uh, at, at uh, more realistic uh, scenarios. So this, this uh, section here is just called Dynamics and Control of Space Structures in, in, in Space. Uh, so <clears throat> what we mean by that is something a little more realistic than a rigid body, really. So you may recall this, this table uh, and the fact that uh, on top of external disturbances and internal one due, due to the sign, which are really the first three in this table, then we have uh, other disturbances that uh, have to do with the fact that the system is not rigid. Uh, of course, rotating machinery, pumps, etc., sloshing, but really I'm mostly interested in this session um, in uh, the dynamics of flexible appendages uh, and and uh, and thermal shocks that also excite uh, vibrations of flexible parts in particular. And the reality is that the majority of satellites, unless you have a tiny CubeSat that has no deployment uh, of any sort, uh, have pretty flexible parts uh, attached to them. A few examples. 
relatively old examples, but the Mars Express mission, for example, uh, sorry about using that word too much, uh, you know, had uh, antennas that are long, 20 meters long. Um, and uh, uh, the usually these, these, these uh, deployable structures are um, light and uh, highly extended, which, as you can imagine, means extremely flexible in many cases. So by extremely flexible, what I mean is that uh, for those who are familiar with the concept and will see it, uh, that when you start talking about modes of vibration, how does that particular piece of the structure uh, behaves when excited, it means that there are low frequencies, which uh, usually correspond to high amplitudes of deformations, and that's, that becomes a problem because you have these parts that do not behave at all as, as rigid components, and so all the equations that basically we have seen uh, almost go down the drain because, because they work for rigid bodies. And you can't really uh, do much with the, uh, as you recall, the uh, quasi-rigid approximation and the energy sink approximation because that's really for high frequencies where things remain still quasi-rigid. Uh, there are vibrations that you, you they're so high frequency and small that you cannot really see much of an effect on the motion other than dissipating the kinetic energy. In this case, it's completely different. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, having a, a, a pendulum attached to your spacecraft, for example, and, and that's going to be difficult to control, but it's possible. Uh, another example, the Turaya spacecraft launched in 2000 um, for uh, mobile communications has a solar array that is 40 meter long. Uh, 40 meter is a huge solar array. Of course, it's light, of course, it's thin, and of course, it's flexible. Plus a deployable antenna that has a diameter of 12 meters. So uh, there's no way you can consider an object like this, a vehicle like this as rigid. Uh, and as you can imagine, you definitely want to be either super slow in changing orientation, not to uh, shake uh, the flexible parts too much, or you need to be very intelligent with the control law uh, so that you reorient if needed your satellite, uh, but at the same time you minimize uh, the, uh, the vibrations of these appendages, uh, which is also possible. You just need to be able to model these uh, these appendages and include their behavior in the feedback control law. And if we have time, we'll see uh, a simple example uh, later on. And then the obvious ones, uh, things like uh, manipulators, they are, well, they are flexible by construction in the sense that they have articulation. So they have elbows and, 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 and so the, the entire uh, manipulator is of course not rigid. Uh, but it may be seen as a uh, collection of uh, rigid uh, links, uh, but that also is not very accurate because these links are pretty long. Uh, this one in particular is the one attached to the International Space Station. And uh, as you can see, it's uh, almost two tons in weight. Uh, it extends for almost 18 meters and can handle uh, more than 100 tons uh, of, of payload. Of course, this is a, this is doable. Uh, being able to maneuver so much mass, it's because we are in space, and so. Uh, but still, you can imagine how flexible this is. Um, so, going to something that looks uh, more like a classical spacecraft without uh, huge appendages. Going back to the Iconos satellite that I think I introduced at the very beginning, um, you know. A satellite that looks like this, uh, it's for imaging on the ground, of course. It's, uh, you know, it, it may be considered at first approximation rigid, but if you go into the details of all the components, as you can see here, you see that that assumption goes away pretty quickly. Uh, you have these solar panels that are deployed and they are kept up uh, through these different beams. Uh, you have all these little parts, uh, antennas and uh, uh, sun sensor and, and so on that, that, that basically come out uh, of the satellite after it's deployed. Uh, the, the gimbal antenna, which is really the, uh, you know, one of the payloads. So uh, 
you can imagine how also this satellite, which is not terribly extended in space, it doesn't have those long, you know, solar panels, 40 meter long, it doesn't have an antenna of 12 meter of diameter, still has so many parts um, that, are, that are thin, that are slender, uh, that will definitely uh, create uh, some uh, oscillatory behavior. Maybe a higher frequencies than in the other cases, for sure, actually, but still uh, it is not rigid. And uh, the, the, the flexibility issue, it's tightly connected to, again, how you intend to use the spacecraft, uh, because you may never excite uh, the flexible modes. Uh, if, you know, if you grab a piece of paper, and uh, which is extremely flexible, like I'm doing right now, you know, if I, if I move it back and forth slowly, yeah, I can see the shape changing, but if I start doing this, of course, at higher frequency, I'm exciting one of the natural modes of vibration. And so it really boils down to what is the use of the satellite. Uh, and in this particular case, this is an agile spacecraft. Um, there are a couple more slides that talk about how this satellite is used. And it shows you here uh, the uh, ground track, which is that um, <coughs> black arrow in the middle. The gray area, it's uh, 1,445 kilometers, and it's, uh, uh, it's showing you the accessible collection region for picturing purposes. And, uh, and each, uh, and this watt width is 11 kilometers. So, so this satellite can, you know, explore on a pass, a region of this size, um, and you can imagine how uh, quickly it needs to be able to orient itself uh, to look down at different locations on this gray area. Uh, another image here, uh, well, different, different tasks you can uh, assign to the spacecraft. You can assign it, for example, to scan across the path. So the, the black line is, is the ground track. So you can task it to, uh, <clears throat> to uh, take images, I would say, left and right of the, of the track or along the, the ground track. Or, you know, just, uh, just scan uh, a certain region around the track or just single scenes, you know, take pictures of single scenes. And this is probably the most demanding because you have to uh, quickly change pointing uh, <clears throat> on a single pass. And so something like this, despite being relatively small in terms of, uh, of extension of appendages, uh, will definitely excite the modes. And, and that becomes a challenge for who's designing the control algorithms. Uh, in this case, I believe we're talking about CMGs. I don't know if it says anything. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, propellant. This is using thrusters, actually. I believe. Uh, torque rods. Torque rods. Yeah. Uh, RWA. No, this has thrusters and, and reaction rules. Anyways, so designing the control algorithm for this is going to be more difficult than definitely what we have seen. And so the bottom line is that we need to start talking about structural analysis. And uh, I'm sure that what we're going to cover next is uh, probably known material in a sense, but it's good to refresh. Uh, some references are at the bottom of, uh, uh, of the... Uh, of these slides here and there. So um, let's start from the very basic uh, concepts of uh, multiple degrees of freedom systems where we have lumped parameter models. Um, so we're engineers, and so we end up simplifying things, linearizing things uh, to the extent that we can. Uh, and uh, quite often, Flexibility is represented as uh, concentrated, you know, mass, lumped masses connected by springs and maybe dampers uh, to give us a first uh, approximation of uh, 
the continuum uh, that we actually have in reality. Uh, this is an example, the classical one, the two cards on uh, a frictionless ground connected to uh, the ground itself, the first one, and then between the two with, um, with the spring, okay, two different springs. So, um, what we usually do is we write the equations of motion to solve for these, two of them, we obviously don't want to derive them right now, but you start with the free body diagram, you know that the, the two masses are exchanging equal and opposite forces. Uh, we define these K11, K12, K21 and K22, so that we can combine the different uh, uh, <coughs> combinations of the constants of the springs and basically rewrite, reorganize the equations as you see here, which allows me to put everything into this form, uh, matrix form. Mass matrix M, and the second time derivatives of the variables of interest here, um, which are in this case X1 and 2, plus the stiffness matrix that multiplies the, uh, the state vector itself, X1 and X2. And uh, we will see that eventually we can have also a damping uh, term that multiplies the time derivatives of x1 and x2, but for now we don't we don't have that. Okay, so that's what we usually do. Now, being a linear system, sorry that I went into projection mode. Um, we can talk about solutions in terms of the natural modes, and by mode we'll see we mean um, a frequency and uh, a shape of the formation. Um, that's really what mode means. That's why we talk about modes of vibration, uh, because you know it's, it's it's describing how the shape changes, how quickly it changes, and that's the frequency, and and how it looks like, and that's the shape. So since those two equations we just saw are linear and homogeneous, uh, if I find two solutions uh, and then I uh, combine them uh, linearly, uh, that also represents a solution. So uh, we can, you know, superimpose uh, solutions li uh, linearly and get another one. So we can basically seek for uh, special, special solutions that are called synchronous ones. Uh, that's what we're doing here, where we assume that the x, 1 and 2, as functions of time, behave the same way uh, in terms of their dependency on, of time. That's why, they're, that's why they're called synchronous, through a function f of t. Uh, and it's, you know, it's basically an oscillation amplitude that it's time dependent. And then uh, they are different in terms of the constants, U1 and U2. They represent the displacement configuration. Um, so basically different, different uh, shapes of the formation. Um, of course, if you take the ratio of these, it is independent on time, of time. And so the implication is that um, Basically, with these synchronous solutions, the shape doesn't change during motion. Uh, the amplitude of the displacements does, but not the shape, because uh, there's a constant ratio between u1 and u2 since I chose them to be constant. Anyways, this is my choice. I impose a potential solution to look like this, and I'll see what I get out of, of, of this imposition of having a synchronous solution. Because in general, I could have u1 f1 of t and u2 f2 of t, and that's perfectly fine, um, <clears throat> but for now I'm focusing on having the same function of time. Okay, so if I use that assumption, keep clicking the wrong buttons here. If I uh, use that assumption and I plug it into my initial differential equation, so basically I take these, uh, this form for the solution and I plug it into uh, this one, equation number three, this is what my equations will look like, okay? Uh, now, if you want to go back and using the mass and K matrix, uh, you will find the following expression, uh, nothing more than just using a matrix form, where U is, again, is the vector U1 and U2. If you pre-multiply both sides uh, times the U transpose uh, vector, well, it becomes a scalar equation. And this is what you get. Uh, and so, introducing lambda being equal to this ratio, u transpose ku over u transpose mu, you can rewrite seven uh, in the following form. 
f double dot plus lambda ft equals zero. Um, and so then if you take this equation and equation six, you can finally get uh, this relationship uh, between the K and M matrices, the lambda and uh, the U, uh, the U vector. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the result here is that the time dependent, there's two results here. The time dependent amplitude has to satisfy that, that equation, eight, and the vector uh, of constants uh, for the displacements instead satisfy equation nine. Again, I'm just seeking for a solution to my problem of the two masses and two springs that look like this. And I got to these results. Okay. Now, um, we know that lambda is a real quantity because it's the ratio of two quadratic forms. Uh, in addition, it is positive. As you think about it, the numerator is, is some sort of potential energy, which is definitely positive because it's... Uh, you know, dimension, dimensionally speaking, it's a, it's a spring constant that multiplies displacement uh, squared, so definitely a, a, a potential energy, while the uh, denominator as the dimensions of a kinetic energy is uh, a mass that multiplies, uh, again, displacement uh, squared, which is always positive as well. And so the fact that this lambda that I've introduced is always positive allows me to call it uh, guess what? Omega. So we start talking about frequencies. So I call lambda omega squared just to, to make it clear that can only be positive. Uh, so same relationship as before for the time varying amplitude. It will just look like this. F double dot plus omega squared Ft equals zero. Uh, nothing special. And so now I, you know, after all these uh, exercises, I finally put my uh, equation for f for this function of time into the form that I wanted to make to basically make it look like an harmonic oscillator. Uh, that that was really the whole point of doing this. And so we do know that this differential equation has a solution that will look like some amplitude cosine of the omega uh, that I've introduced. And again, omega is a square root of this ratio, uh, u transpose ku over u transpose mu. So c, some amplitude, uh, omega t, cosine omega t minus a phase. Uh, the phi and c, the amplitude of this oscillation and the phase, will depend on the initial conditions. Instead, the omega depends on uh, the system parameters uh, that and has to be yet uh, is yet to be determined, but uh, it's already obvious here that it depends on k, on m, and those are you know system quantities. It depends on the springs, on the masses, and uh, and also the shapes. Uh, but uh, most of the springs and the masses, really, as we will see. In fact, um, this is what I get. I get that. Uh, the second equation, uh, the one that has to do with the uh, shapes, the, 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 the vector of, of, of uh, use, uh, now that I have lambda being equal to omega squared will look like this. And so the values of omega have to satisfy this equation. Uh, this is an algebraic eigenvalue problem. Um, it doesn't have, uh, so uh, we, we need to find a solution. And so we need to find the omega squared so that uh, we have non-trivial solutions. So um, for our two degrees of freedom problem, uh, this equation is the same as, so basically equation 12 is equation 13, uh, just because we have two degrees of freedom. And we have defined already k and m, OK? Um, so this is what you get. You bring everything to the left-hand side, and uh, you basically end up with a matrix that multiplies the vectors of u1 and u2 equals zero, and so you have non-trivial solutions only if, obviously, the determinant of that matrix is zero. Uh, and in other words, you solve for the omegas that make that determinant zero, and this is what you get. The omega 1, 2, 1 and 2 squared uh, uh, are what we call the natural frequencies of the system, and as you can see, they depend on the masses and the spring bodies uh, through those coefficients q, k, 1, 1, 2, 2, etc. There are nothing more than combinations of the k's, okay? 
All right, so that's for the uh, that example. Uh, now that we go back to uh, everything we have constructed, uh, now we have two possible, basically, uh, functions of time now, because we found two omegas, and so we can have an F1 and F2 with different Cs and different omegas and different faces. To completely solve the problem, we need to find now the constants U's, uh, and by inserting these omegas that we found into the, that we found here into uh, 14, uh, right, this equation. Now we have the omegas, and now we have to, we want to focus on solving actually for U1 and U2. Obviously, we're not gonna find unique solutions. We're going to find the relationship between U1 and U2. This is an homogeneous system. We set the determinant to be zero, which means that U1 and U2 can be found, uh, but as a relationship uh, between each other, not uniquely. And in fact, with omega 1, you find this relationship between U1 and U2. Um, and uh, for omega 2, instead, you find this relationship between U1 and U2. Okay? Uh, these are called model vectors, the natural displacement configurations. Uh, the ratio is unique, but the values can be arbitrary. Uh, and so what, we, what we've done basically, just to summarize, I want to go back from the beginning. We have a system, a lumped parameter system. We write it in this form, uh, explicitly assembling a mass and a stiffness matrix. We find, we try to find synchronous solutions. That allows me to uh, define two equations for the time bearing component of the synchronous solution and the uh, vector of displacements u1 and u2, or vector of, of configuration, if you like. I can eventually find uh, the solutions for omegas by setting this uh, algebraic eigenvalue problem. It's an homogeneous system. Finding the omegas then allows me to find the relationships between uh, the U displacements. Not uniquely, uh, the ratio is unique, but not their values. And so finally, what I found for my system is natural frequencies. In this case, it's a two degree of freedom system. So two frequencies, two natural frequencies, and two relationships, corresponding relationships for relationships, I'm sorry, for the model vectors. And that's what we call a natural mode. So when you talk about modes of vibration, that means a frequency, a mode is a frequency, and a relationship uh, between or among the, the, the displacements that correspond to that frequency. And so then in general, the motion at any time can be really obtained as a superposition of the two natural modes, if you like. So basically, we can take everything that we have done and finally put it together. So you can see, uh, you can write C1, the vector U1 cosine omega 1 t minus the phase uh, corresponding to the first mode, that's n plus the second one. Uh, and then basically, the only thing you can do is uh, Define obviously you will have initial conditions and that will define everything that is missing here. So omega one and omega two are calculated once and for all. Uh, going back to this solution, you know your system, you know the masses involved, you know the spring values. So omega one and omega two are what they are, and they are unique, and you find them. Uh, but then everything else here, it's really dependent on your initial conditions. And you can actually make the system oscillate. Uh, in each of the two natural modes exclusively. You can choose initial conditions so that, for example, C2 is zero, and all you see is this first mode of oscillation, and vice versa. Uh, and I'm sure you know you can you can think about several examples what I've done shaking my paper before. Depending on how I excite my system, um, I can make it you know uh, oscillate in different ways. Maybe maybe I can grab my piece of paper again and and go with another very simple example, but basically I am the one setting the, the conditions for the motion of this of this flexible system. And if I translate, so my initial condition is a velocity, constant velocity, uh, no excitation. You see the mode is this almost a rigid rigid body motion. And, and zero frequency, uh, it's a perfectly legit mode. 
it corresponds to rigid motion. But if I start exciting with an input that has a certain frequency, uh, whatever that is, I am exciting uh, some omegas here uh, in my in my flexible structure. And depending on how quickly I do it, I can see different different shapes. So I know this is a terrible example, probably, but uh, that's that's really the, the, the main idea. And it is very important uh, to understand that by setting the initial conditions, and eventually we'll see by setting how you control the system uh, with feedback control, you have uh, the ability to excite and see some of these modes. And, and you know, we'll generalize this, but as you can imagine, for a structure that has almost infinite numbers of uh, point masses as we discretize it, uh, and, and an infinite number of springs that connect the masses. Well, uh, you can excite some of them if you want, or, or be careful and, and try not to excite any of those modes. Um, and so that's, it's very important to understand that once you break it down into modes, natural modes, you have the ability to uh, control them. Okay, uh, let's see. What are the properties of these? uh modes that we have defined well there's a few uh the model vector so the u's are orthogonal with respect to the mass matrix in other words uh the equation 20 uh, it's is true so u transpose m u is equal to uh ui transpose m uj is equal to uj transpose m ui ui and, and it's zero so you take two two uh model vectors distinct model vectors uh and uh you, you multiply them uh with the m in between uh, that that gives you zero so that's what orthogonality with respect to m means for any uh i and j model vectors where i is uh, not equal to j and uh the same is valid uh, in terms of orthogonality with respect to the stiffness matrix. Uh, you can easily demonstrate that uh, starting from uh, equation 12, I'm saying, for example, from this uh, to show the second one, but they're pretty easily demonstrated. And as a homework, if you want, you can show uh, that these two are valid for the example that we have seen. That should be pretty easy to do. Because we are, you have everything. You have M, you have K, and you have the vectors, U1 uh, and U2, so you can easily show that to yourself by just plugging in the values and see that these come out to be zero. Um, now, since we have said that the in the modes that are given by a frequency, each mode is a frequency, and the relationship um, of the components of the uh, modal vector, since those modal vectors are not given uniquely, but just as a relationship of, you know, uh, u1 over u2, how they look like, uh, usually we normalize them for conveniency. Uh, and so, uh, since the total magnitude is really arbitrary, uh, we, can, we can do different things. The commonly used normalization methods, uh, well, you can arbitrarily choose a value for one of the two. Say that the uij is one, um, and, and, and so the other one uh, will be derived from there. So in other words, in our example, let me go back a few slides. Uh, I just choose, I don't know, u11 for the model vector that corresponds to the first natural frequency. I choose that to be one. And then as a consequence, u21 is just what you see to the right hand side of this equation. So it's uniquely determined. So you choose a value for one of them and the other one will be automatically solved for. Or um, uh, the normalization through, you know, of the entire model vector, uh, divide everything by its, or its magnitude uh, and, and, and you obtain a, a vector that is of norm one. Or uh, very common is um, normalizing through uh, the uh, the mass matrix or stiffness matrix um, by using these uh, these relationships here. Remember that uh, the normalization is an arbitrary process. It's just our choice to do so. It doesn't affect the shapes uh, and the motion solution. Uh, 
uh, but it helps to visualize. Uh, in other words, if I want to visualize, other, the frequency is the frequency, so it tells me, you know, how quickly things are going, are oscillating. Uh, but if I want to visualize the shape of the deformation, then one one way is to uh, impose a unit value for one of the components of the model vector, and then you know everything is, is set. So it's just a uh, it's a way to visualize things, uh, and, and and you need to keep in mind that everything may be proportional to that. So that is not really the amplitude. Again, you will need initial conditions to to find the final uh, uh, real solution. Uh, this is an exercise that you can definitely perform by yourself, and it's exactly uh, the same problem as before. Uh, natural frequencies and model vectors, well, uh, well, that was done for you already. Uh, really, what you would have to do is point three, to visualize the mode shapes, uh, normalizing using method one, which is exactly the one that I was just discuss discussing. Just give it a one for one of the components of the model vector and solve for the other, and, and that gives you the shape, and by shape means that basically, um, if I assume that U1 is 1 in this case, say that we are talking about meters, then the displacement will be 1 meter, and then the other one will be whatever comes out of that. And, and uh, in the synchronous solution for that particular mode, the two masses are oscillating according to the same uh, time uh, law, and, uh, and the, the, the way the shape of the system, so the way they are separated from each other, is given by the u1 and u2. That's really what it means, okay? Uh, and that's for mode 1. Then mode 2 will be something else, and then the general solution can be a linear combination of the two. Uh, okay. Um, a very important and commonly performed uh, operation is, is decoupling the equations which is really the mo what we call model analysis now. So we introduced the concept of modes, a frequency and uh, a vector that is defined uh, in terms of the ratios of its components. Uh, but even more uh, useful is, is decoupling these, these, these behaviors. Uh, and so if we start from our given an, an equations of motion in the most general form, uh, and, and we can talk about our own problem with the two masses, well, you have mx double dot plus kx equals zero. Um, if you perform this coordinate transformation, where now x is equal to what? To u, q of t. Where this u matrix is your uh, model vectors, u1 and u2. If you plug this uh, substitution, this assumption into, uh, well, actually, it's not an assumption, it's really how we built things before. It's the synchronous solution, if you, if you think about it. Uh, it's a model vector and a function of time. Uh, so if you substitute this into the equations of motion, you get this, and we've seen it before. But now you basically have new, if you like, mass and stiffness matrices. They are just U transpose MU for the new mass matrix, and U transpose KU for the stiffness matrix. And now the new variable is Q. Nothing more than that. So this is how the equations will look like. Um, so finally, if we use the normalization of the third type in the slide, well, slide 30 is a long, um, should correct that. But basically, this one, slide 21, uh, if you use this normalization, if you assume that the model vectors are such that uh, u transpose mu is 1, which is perfectly legit to do, then this term here is an identity matrix. And then, guess what? The second matrix will look like just the natural frequency squared, because in the same slide, if you normalize the model vectors with the mass matrix, so imposing the U transpose MU is one, as a consequence, you will have the U transpose KU is omega squared. So the beauty of all that we have done is that I can finally write my equations of motion like uh, this expression that you see at the bottom. And so you have two uncoupled decoupled equations, uh, which is which is uh, very, very useful. Uh, they show clearly the two frequencies. Uh, so, uh, well, just, just um, an interesting fact here. Um, when we have two 
identical one degrees of freedom systems and they are connected by weak springs. Um, the resulting to the system is characterized by uh, natural frequencies that are very close in values and uh, you obtain what is called the beat phenomenon, which basically means that one, when one of the two is at the uh, lowest amplitude, the other one is at the max and vice versa. Just an interesting, uh, interesting example. Okay, uh, we are going to generalize things, uh, but I would like to take a quick break, a five minute break, if you don't mind. Any questions so far? No questions. All right, we're going to resume at 55 if that's okay with you.